What does that mean, Dorian? What does that mean? Hi guys, it's Sarah. Welcome back to another video here on my channel. I hope you guys are doing well. Did everybody have a good Christmas? Or Yule? Or Hanukkah? I hope so. This is coming out after Christmas, so hopefully everybody had a great week. If you can hear any light pittering sounds or giggles from off camera. My sister is staying with me. We've had like a six day long sleepover. It's been the absolute most amazing time ever, but they're in the room with me right now. So they are like two feet in front of me doing, are you doing bullet journal? Yeah. Today we are jumping back into the Throne of Glass universe. We're gonna be talking about Crown of Midnight, which is the third book. We're just barreling through. I'm feeling really good about this. This script took so long to do though. <laughs> Two days, it's over a hundred pages, um, but it's gonna be fine. We're gonna get through it, it's gonna be fine. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already, just so you don't miss any videos in this series. And without further ado, let's get into it. So in the last book, our girl won the competition. She became King's Champion, which means she's basically just going around putting her assassin skills to work, killing, anybody that the king asks her to kill. We open with her strolling into the castle. She's got a sack in one hand. She goes right into the king's council room. Dorian and Kale are both in the room with him. And she just pulls a severed head from the bag and gives it to the king. And he's like, mm, this is pretty damaged. It doesn't really look like him. How do I know it's him? So she pulls out a severed hand with the dude's signet ring on it and gives it over and is like, is that proof enough? I can't with her, she's insane. Dorian is pretty spooked by this. He's standing there like, damn, she really do be killing people. But Kale? is horrified, sick to his stomach, shaking in his little leather boots. He does not like seeing her this way. Also, all three of them have to kind of play this game where they have to pretend they're not friends when they're in front of the king because they don't want the king to know. But it's just so silly because they all live in the castle. So we know he knows that they're all friends. But in these moments, she's very like cool, calm and collected. Kale is like, I'm not even gonna look at her. She disgusts me. And Dorian is like, I'm the prince. Nobody make eye contact with me or I'll have you beheaded. Her newest target from the king is Archer Fenn. He is a courtesan in the city of Rifthold where she lives. And she actually knows him because when they were younger, he came and trained at the Assassin's Guild in like self-defense. She asks the king for more time. And she says that she wants to like try to figure out more about Archer because she knows him and she's sure he probably has more connections than the king's even aware of. And the king agrees because she's been doing such good work. We get a quick little Dorian POV. This book especially, the POVs start switching around. So there's lots of different people. We're not just with Selena anymore. He's trying to come to terms with the fact that she killed two people and his dad ordered it and this is her new job. Like that's kind of, it's kind of weighing on him, but also he still really likes her and he doesn't care because kind of in the same way that he's the prince and he has to do things he doesn't always agree with. He's like, well, she's an assassin. <laughs> I guess it's fine. What he's really worried about is the fact that she's not acting like herself anymore. So that version of her where she was like pretending to be Lillian, she still is by the way. So her name's Selena. She's still going by Lillian in the castle, but then the boys obviously call her Selena. I'm still just gonna call her that, but know that everybody else is calling her Lillian. She doesn't wear her clothes anymore, all her pretty dresses and stuff. So she's always in like all black, a tunic, leather pants, her hair's in a braid. It's not like down and curly anymore. So Dorian's just like, I feel like I don't know you. And that's what he's struggling with more than anything. He's starting to worry that the relationship they had in the previous book was all a lie because if she is actually this like cold collected assassin lady, maybe the version of her that she was with him where she was being all sweet and flirty and funny isn't her and she was just using him so that he would help her win the competition. Kale follows Selena out of the council room and like I said, it's tense and awkward between them, definitely more so than with Dorian because Kale is like disgusted by the fact that she kills people, which I'm like, dude, you knew she was an assassin. Like you've known that the whole time, but him like reconciling the fact that she kills people for a living, it, he just can't do it. He's like, I don't understand. Remember he's the captain of the guard 
and he's only killed the one guy in the last book somehow. It comes out though that the reason why he's so worried and nervous and stressed and weird is because he's super, super worried about her. And he's protective. He even gives her a hug in this moment and she's like, we don't normally do this, what's going on? Once Kale leaves her in her rooms and she's kind of decompressing, we find out, surprise, she hasn't been killing anybody. She's been faking their deaths and then getting them out of the city because she doesn't like the king. She hasn't been seeing Elena in her dreams anymore, but she is having nightmares. And she has one that night of being back down in the tomb. But this time, Cain is still alive and he's chasing her with that creature that she already killed. She also says that Cain whispers her name, her true name. So what the fuck does that mean? Nehemia is still her best friend in the castle. They are just getting closer and closer every day. Remember that Nehemia is also working with the rebels and now Selena knows that, but she's still a little nervous to tell her everything. So Nehemia thinks she's killing people. Currently, Nehemia is focusing her time trying to get a meeting with the king. There are two main labor camps, Endover, which is where Selena was, and then Calicula, which is like also just as big, just as terrible, but that is where most of the LOA people go. But the king refuses to meet with her, and things are just getting worse at both camps. Kale and Selena are still doing their morning runs together. This is his point of view, and he reminds <laughs> us that she's like super graceful and strong. She runs like a deer. He also tells us that he is waking up in the middle of the night, covered in sweat, thinking it's Cain's blood. He feels a lot of guilt for having killed him, but also he knows he did the right thing in saving Selena's life. She can tell something's wrong with him and tries to figure it out. He kind of gets cold and then says, how often do you think about the people you've killed? And at first she's like, okay, let's not make this about me. That's rude. And he has to be like, no, no, I'm, I'm being serious. Like, I, I just need to know because I'm really struggling. And she's like, oh, this whole thing is about Cain. That makes sense. She tells him that she'll never forget the people that she's killed and that sometimes, oftentimes, it feels like another person did those things as if it's like an out-of-body experience, but also she'll never forget that he saved her life. When they get back to the castle after their run, Kale's all like sweaty and cute and Selena's like, is he blind? Is he stupid? Because all the court girls are out and about standing like in the garden watching them come back and Kale's just oblivious to it. He's not paying attention at all. He wants to help her with the Archer Finn mission, but she refuses and she's like, I don't, I don't need you to babysit me. Absolutely not. Dorian runs into them and he has his cousin Roland with him. And this dude is one of the worst people we're gonna meet in the whole story. He's just sleazy, gross, ridiculous, rich boy. Like all the things that you probably thought Dorian was gonna be, Roland actually is. Kale, like on sight when he sees Roland is like, I will kill that guy. I will punch him in the face right now. And Dorian's like, I oh, know, okay, I you just needed to say hi to him. We're gonna walk away so quickly. Kale's like, done, he's absolutely over it. Roland has come to stay because he's been given a position on the King's Council. Good for him. We cut abruptly to a Dorian POV. He's watching Selena and Kale walk away and Kale's got his hand on Selena's lower back and Dorian's like, oh, so it's okay when he touches her. Okay, I see how it is. Dorian also, doesn't like his cousin. Even though when they were all together in a group of four, he was being civil and everything, he can't stand Roland. He wants him gone. Now that she's King's Champion, Selena is being paid really well for her work, so she's back on her Barbie girl bullshit. She comes home from a shopping spree, just like laden with gifts, and Dorian is in her rooms waiting on her when she gets home. Things are tense between the two of them, and he's like, mm, can't I come see you? I thought we were friends. Didn't you say you wanted to be my friend? I'm not allowed to just come visit you like we used to. She's worried though. She's like, I don't think in her head, she doesn't say this out loud to him. She's like, I don't think I can just be this man's friend because he's gorgeous and everything she wants out of a partner. And so she's terrified of getting too close to him. So she pushes him away and he's like, what am I doing wrong? Do you want me to fight for you? Is that it? Is that what you want? And she's like, no, Dorian, I just want you to leave me alone. Girl, you're lying to this poor man. Just tell him the truth. What the heck? Selena goes into town to start trailing Archer, but he is super well protected, which she already knew. He's like very, very popular amongst the girlies. So she only gets a quick glimpse of him coming out of his house into a carriage. And she's like, there's no point. I'm never gonna be able to get to him. I'm gonna have to run into him somehow. Now that she's not dating Dorian anymore, 
She's allowed to be closer to Kale, so they're having dinner together regularly. She goes over to his room and just hangs out with him late into the night. They read, they look at the fire, he does paperwork. They're besties. She lies to him and just continues on with that whole, I'm gonna get close to Archer so I can find out about what secret people he's meeting with so I can give the king even more names and kill even more people. And Kale's like, oh, I love that plan. She wants to know why exactly he hates Roland because remember he went like, absolutely, I'll kill you, I'll punch you in the face mode when he saw him earlier, but he just says he's the worst and doesn't wanna talk about it. Then he asks if she knows who Ferran is. That's right, the guy that killed Sam. She has a bit of a panic attack, but Kale tells her he's dead, along with three of his most top secret men. They were killed by freaking Wesley. But then Wesley was killed by Arabin, and it's really bad. He was like, it's really gross. He was pinned like to the fence outside Ferran's house. And there was so much blood that Kale's like, he definitely was like impaled on it and then left there to die. And the people inside were just told to leave him there while he died. So it was really painful. So Selena feels terrible because she puts it all together and is like, oh, Wesley was trying to warn me that it was a trap that night that I went after everybody because Arabin set me up. So then he went after Ferran and then Arabin killed him because Arabin and Ferran were working together. She is now finally planning to get bloody, bloody revenge on Arabin, which is about time. She tells Kale about Sam. Remember, Dorian knows that she had a friend named Sam and he died and it happened around the time she was captured, but she like tells Kale what happened. And she admits that she like feels so much guilt over his death and she's never forgiven herself. He says that she lived and she survived everything that happened after his death, which means she didn't fail Sam. She did exactly what he would have wanted her to do. Then he says that he was dating a girl in the court and Roland came to town and thought it would be super funny for Kale to find him sleeping with his girlfriend. And Selena's like, okay, but why did your girlfriend cheat on you? What the heck? And he's like, oh yeah, that's even worse. Roland lied to her because he's one of Dorian's family members. So he's like high up and he's got all these connections and all this wealth. So he pretended like he was gonna marry her just so he could sleep with her and hurt Kale. It was all a lie. So they bond over losing their first loves tragically, which is really sweet. He walks her back to her rooms and she tells him that that girlfriend was the greatest fool alive to pick Roland over him. are getting spooky. Selena can't sleep so she goes down to the library and as she reaches the doors she sees a creepy hooded figure. She says it moves like shadow and smoke and when it turns to look at her it like sniffs the air like an animal. The eye of Elena pulses on her neck and blue light comes out and the creature is like absolutely not and runs away. She's reminded once again that it's very clear the king is planning something that's bigger than the current empire that he has. And she's terrified of what it all could mean if that thing is connected to it. Selena goes back down to the secret tomb chamber in hopes of seeing Elena, but instead she runs into Mort, the talking doorknob. Yeah, I wish I was kidding, I'm not. I don't know where this idea came from and why he wasn't in Throne of Glass, but she really said now the doorknob on the door to the tomb, he talks, he's magical. He's silly and goofy and perfect and I love him. Remember that magic does not exist in the kingdom, so he should not be alive and talking, but he's like, girl, I'm ancient, okay? New magic might not work, but old magic is here to stay. You can't stop me. Turns out King Brandon himself put Mort on the door so that he could watch over Gavin and Elena. When Selena introduces herself and gives him her name, he laughs and says it's the funniest thing he's ever heard. He explains to her that the reason why Elena hasn't been back is because she used way too much magic and nearly like burnt herself out coming to visit Selena so much in the last book. So now she kind of has to like recharge and wait a little bit before she can come again. We get a little more info about the tomb. It is covered with stars and word marks. It's just like carved really beautifully on the floors and the wall and the ceiling. We also learn that Damaris, Gavin's sword that he's like holding on his sarcophagus, is called the Sword of Truth. We also get a little backstory lore about Erewhon. He's the Dark Lord of this universe and he's the one that led the war that led to all the Fae being killed long time ago. 
Mort actually has a message from Elena, which is, if I could leave you in peace, I would, but you have lived your life aware that you will never escape certain burdens. Whether you like it or not, you are bound to the fate of the world. As the king's champion, you are now in a position of power and you can make a difference in the lives of many. Cain and the Ritterac, that creature that she killed, were just the beginning of the threat. There is a far deadlier power poised to devour the world. Also, Mort and Elena know that she hasn't really been killing people. She insists that it is not her fate to save everyone, but Mort is like, girl, don't lie to me. You know that it is. He tells her that she has to figure out what the king is planning and they're sorry for everything that she lost, but she cannot be selfish or cowardly any longer. And Selena's like, <laughs> screw you guys. And she runs away. Selena ends up taking Kale with her into town. She makes him play like kind of boyfriend while she's going into a store so she can accidentally run into Archer. Archer is so pretty, 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 pretty and super charming and so happy to see her. Everyone in these books has green eyes and Archer Finn is no exception. I don't know what it is with SJM and the Throne of Glass world, but everybody has green eyes. So yeah, he's super happy to see her and he's like, I'm very busy, but I'm so glad that you're back in town. Send me a time and a place and we will make it happen. I will meet with you. In a Kale POV, we learn that he's deeply annoyed that she was actually flirting with Archer and that she seemed to be a little smitten with him. A lot of this book is just Kale realizing that maybe he likes her a little bit and then immediately being like, no, oh my God, she's my friend and she kills people. That's disgusting. I would never do that. He would, he would do that. That night, Kale and Selena get asked to be guards at the state dinner. She sees Dorian with Roland and she's like, I know he must be faking it because there's no way that the guy I was friends with and maybe kind of loved a little bit is actually into Roland and thinks he's a good guy. There's just no way. She also doesn't think that Dorian has any ideas about what his uh, dad is planning because the king is evil, but Dorian is not. And we know that. Then we cut to a Dorian POV. Turns out he's known the whole time that she's been watching him. But unfortunately, he's also caught her watching Kale. And he says that when she looks at Kale, her entire face softens. He gets so annoyed with that whole situation that's brewing and the fact that Roland has been with him and he's been having to like play pretend and be nice to everybody all night that he just leaves early. But Selena follows him out. She asks what's wrong and he's like, absolutely nothing, I'm fine. Even though he is like frozen with rage and his eyes are glazed and he's not hiding it well at all. She tells him that she really doesn't like Roland and she doesn't trust him. And he's like, look, I know he's annoying and literally the worst guy on the planet. He's also harmless, okay? He admits that he thinks that she probably used him to get the King's Champion title. And she's like, oh, okay. And it really hurts her feelings. She gets snippy with him. And she's like, I think you're used to getting what and who you want whenever you want it. And just because you couldn't get what you wanted this one time and Dorian like rounds on her and he's like, you have no idea what I wanted. You didn't even give me the chance to tell you. Oh my God. Instead of talking to him more, she gets upset and just storms off. If Kale is struggling with realizing his feelings, Selena spends this entire book running from them, headfirst, the other direction. But I just can't, y'all. Dorian would have married her. Dorian would have married her in the last book. I'm glad that they don't get married, but he would have done it. Selena ends up going down to the dungeons to see Caltaine. She's been there for two months. She asks Caltaine about Roland because remember Caltaine was part of the court so she knows a lot of the upper families. Caltaine agrees with her that he's terrible and he's got a really bad reputation of doing like horrible terrible things especially to women. Also Duke Parrington has been visiting Caltaine regularly and assaulting her while the night guard just turns the other way. Selena is horrified by this, even though Caltaine, you know, poisoned her and was part of the plot to kill her in the last book. She's like, that's unacceptable behavior. I'll be telling Kale about that. Caltaine's also pitiful right now. She's sick, she's cold. Her headaches are getting worse and worse. And she says that all she can hear is like flapping wings. She thinks they're crows circling outside the dungeons, but Selena can't hear anything. She's not heartless. 
So she takes off her cloak and gives it to Caltaine. And then as she's leaving, Caltaine whispers that she thinks sometimes they brought her to the castle for something bigger than Duke Parrington. She says that maybe there's a bigger purpose and they wanna use her for something, but she can't remember when they come visit her, all of the thoughts and the memories are like broken shards of a mirror and she can't put them back together. We go to Nehemia finding out about what's been happening to Caltaine and she's also really upset and disgusted. Don't worry though, Selena told Kale immediately, and not only did he handle it, he went down and found the night guard men, beat them to a pulp, dismissed them, and got them all replaced in the same afternoon. Nehemia talks to Selena about how her parents, who are in charge of LOA, had told her stories about the old courts that were never this full of like corruption and deceit and people hurting each other. Once upon a time, they used to be all about loyalty and honor and people loved the ruling families. She's specifically talking about Terrison's court, which remember is like the more magical of the empires. Everyone in that court was apparently like deeply connected to each other because King Orlon and his inner circle were amazing and they inspired everybody to want to help them. Selena doesn't really feel like anything like that's ever going to be possible, especially with the king in the picture, because he's ruining everybody. We go to a Dorian POV. He's hiding in the kennels with Kale because his little brother Holland has shown up back at the castle. He is so annoying and terrible, Dorian is like a little bit afraid of him. We actually never meet him on page, but I 100% believe that he is the king of Hybern from Akatar, and I will die on that hill until SJM herself tells me that it's not true. Kale admits that he doesn't like Archer, and he doesn't want Selena getting close to him, and Dorian is like, oh my god, she's gonna kill him, dude. I doubt you have anything to worry about there. Once again, Kale is oblivious to his feelings, so he's like, what do you mean I don't have anything to worry about? And Dorian's like, I don't have time, but you're so stupid. And they just walk away from each other. So Selena goes to dinner with Archer in a sassy red dress. Like it's like tight, tight sleeves, tight bodice. It's different from the normal court fashion. Kale sees her on her way out of the castle and he almost passes out like on site at the look of her in the dress. We get a small side note that Philippa commissioned special hairpins for Selena that are like razor sharp and can be used as weapons because she didn't want her like hiding knives and stuff all over her body. So she has a knife strapped on her thigh, but also her hairpins are weapons. He takes her out to the carriage and she tells him that she'll be fine and she's a big girl and she'll see him tomorrow. And he's like, tomorrow? And she's like, mm, use your imagination. I think you know what we'll be getting up to implying that she's gonna spend the night with Archer. Girl, don't be mean to him just for fun. He's absolutely sick over it too, okay? Kayla's like, oh, okay, have fun with Archer, that's fine. At the dinner, Archer is also like smitten with her. He thinks she's beautiful. They have really fun banter together, especially now that they're both older, because remember he's at the, I mean, she was probably like, what, like 13, 14, and he would have been like 16, 17. So she had a crush on him when they were kids, but now they're like both older. But even the relationship they have and the flirting that they do, it just doesn't feel substantial like it did when she was flirting with Dorian. So I'm not worried about him and you shouldn't be either. Because she sent her carriage away to prove to Kale that she was gonna spend the night with Archer, she has to ride home in Archer's carriage. He invites her to come upstairs with him but she doesn't want to. That leads to them talking a little bit about his work because he's like, you know, it's it's so much different when I choose who I'm with. He works for Clarice, which is the same lady that owns Lysandra. And one day he plans to buy his freedom from her and leave. Then without warning, Selena is like, so I was sent by the king to kill you. And Archer's like, whoa. And in seconds, he's on the other side of the carriage and he has a knife drawn because remember he was trained also by the assassins. He's not as good as her. And he is shaking in his boots. He's like, Selena, please, I can pay you. Don't kill me. Cause he knows she could. She tells him that the king thinks he's part of some rebel movement. He swears that he isn't, but he's like, there is a rebel movement in the city. And I think I could get you information about it. She believes him. And she's like, oh, so is the king targeting the wrong people? And he's like, yeah, because if the disappearances that I've been hearing about are the people he thinks are working against him, that's not the same people I've been told about. The group he's talking about wanna put Aelin Galathinius back on the throne. She's like, what are you talking about? Aelin is dead. Her entire family was murdered. Terrison's court was destroyed. Are you insane? He insists that this group that he's heard about thinks she's alive 
and that she is building an army to go against the king. She is shocked and stunned, but she still gives him the whole, I'm going to kill you, or we can fake your death and you can leave the city. Give me the information that you think you might have soon and I'll help you get out. And he agrees. Back at the castle, once she gets home, Selena goes right to Kale. He's annoyed that it's so late, but also desperately glad that she came home and she makes it clear that nothing happened with Archer. She gives him about half the information she got from Archer and then tells him that she's gonna tell the king only when she knows if it's accurate or not. He tells her to be careful and she's like, what's going on with this whole I'm worried about you be careful nonsense? Like, do you think I can't handle myself? He snaps and he's like, I know that you can handle yourself, but I worry because I care. I know I shouldn't, but I do. So I will always tell you to be careful because I will always care what happens. Okay. Archer takes Selena to a big masquerade ball so that they can get more information on one of the people that he thinks is on this list. He sneaks her into the man's study and she finds a book with a word mark on it. She finds the phrase, it is only with the eye that one can see rightly written in it. Then the man comes barreling into the study and she pretends to be crying and she's like, oh, I'm so sorry. My date, he left me. The housekeeper let me in. I hope it's okay. I just needed a place to be by myself. At first he's like, okay, whatever, get out of my study. And then as she goes to leave, he attacks her and says that not even the housekeeper has a key. So he knows she broke in. She manages to stab him and get out, but not before he cuts her on the arm with a dagger and it's poisoned. So she's passing out, it's not good. She manages to get back to the castle, like she runs from this ball all the way back to the castle without getting in a carriage. And then she stumbles through the rooms trying to get to Kale. She makes it to him, whispers Gloriella, and passes out in his arms. We cut abruptly to a Kale POV. He is horrified. He says it's one of the longest nights he's ever had in his entire life. Originally, when she'd come running into the room covered in blood, he was like, oh my God, she's bleeding out, she's dying. But then he realized that it wasn't hers and there was just a small cut on her arm and he was like, Gloriella, right, she's been poisoned. So he carefully took her up to her rooms and he called the healers and kept everything hush hush because he didn't want the king to find out and get mad at her for getting in trouble. And then he spent the whole night with her, sitting with her while she threw up and taking care of her while she slept. He also, in his head, says that he's glad she killed the man because if she hadn't, he would kill him himself. Kale, I have questions. So are you okay with killing? Are you not okay with killing? You're giving me mixed signals. Selena wakes up and Kale is still in her room asleep in the chair next to the bed. He's pissed and he says that she scared him half to death and she better not ever do anything like that ever again. She's worried that he's gonna get in trouble for covering up her mistakes to the king, but he says that he'll handle it. Once she's feeling better, Selena goes back down to the library, nervous about running into that creature again, but thankfully it's fine. It's a really, really big library and she starts to wonder what could be down below them because remember there's tunnels under her room. So she's like, are there like secret tunnels here where there's like more knowledge? Because the king outlawed everything, but she wonders if there's stuff hidden somewhere else. So she starts looking for a way down and exploring like the darker wings of the library. And she remembers that when she was here with Kale a few months ago during the competition, she felt something down below them underneath the library, like moving around. Dorian wakes up from an accidental nap because he also spent the whole night up worrying about her. And now he's having nightmares. He's freezing cold even though his rooms are sealed up and all the windows are closed. And he has a headache. He gets up from the couch and for a second, he thinks he sees a ring of frost around where he'd been laying, but then he blinks and it goes away. selena has been wandering the library for three hours when she finds a super dark tapestry with nothing woven on it. It's just like thick black fabric. I wonder if this is the void fabric mentioned in Akatar. She finds a secret door behind it, just like the one in her room behind the Elena tapestry. So she was right, this chamber also leads down into tunnels and there's like a draft blowing up from it and she can smell iron on that wind. Iron, remember, is the element that's immune to magic. She goes down and finds like a smooth iron door that's locked and she uses her dagger to look under it and sees eyes in the darkness and she's so scared that she convinces herself it was probably just a rat. It wasn't a rat, Iggy. We all know it wasn't a rat. <laughs>
There's a big special dinner that night because there's a visiting singer named Raina Goldsmith coming to sing for the royal family. She performs songs that are like ancient about the old stories and forgotten lands and magic. When it's time for her final song, she turns to the royal family and dedicates it to them. It's a song about a fey woman who was blessed with magic and her power was sought by conquering kings and lords. Everybody fell in love with her, but there was only one single knight that fell in love with who she was and not what she was, and that was the one that she loved back. It's not a super respectful set of songs to sing for the king who outlawed magic. Yet the king is sitting there, smiling at her, listening, enjoying it. That final song really touches Selena and she ends up crying and she looks over at Kale and he's also really emotional. So they're just like smiling at each other, enjoying it together. We cut to Dorian at the dinner watching Selena and Kale look at each other. He goes cold again and he stops hearing the music because my boy's having a panic attack. He says that not ever, not once, did she ever look at him like that. So he vows to move on. He says he doesn't want to be like the ancient kings in the story and try to keep her for himself. She deserves a loyal, brave knight who won't fear her, which is just hysterical because Kale is terrified of her and what she does, but it's the thought that counts, Dorian. I hear where you're coming from. He also says that he himself deserves someone that will love him for who he is. He closes his eyes and takes a few deep breaths. And when he opens them, he says that he lets her go. We love a man who sounds like he's been in therapy. I love him. Yikes, though. We cut to the king's point of view a few hours later. He's down in the dungeons, standing in front of the butcher's block, and it's already covered in blood. Reyna is dragged forward and put on the block. Yeah, so she's in trouble. And he says that what she did and the songs she sang were encouraging magic and they were an affront to the gods. She quietly explains to him that she worked for 10 years to become famous enough to get invited to sing for him because she wanted to prove to him that there were still people out there who kept the old ways and remembered the ancient times. Then she says that her daughter was only 16 when he killed her and her sister was only 36 and her neighbors were 70. She's reciting her list of the dead as the ax falls and she dies. It's such a good, delicious scene though, I love it. We get a scene of Nehemia and Selena having breakfast together and tensions are starting to rise. Nehemia is having a hard time reconciling how she feels about Selena and then the work that Selena does for the king. And she's like, how exactly am I supposed to tell my parents that my best friend is a murderer? She's also upset that Selena seems to only be worried about her own personal freedom. And she's kind of got no intention or want to help the other people and do things behind the king's back to help the slaves and stuff like that. Selena is so upset about the fact that Nehemia is being so hard on her and seems to like be genuinely upset with her, that she breaks and tells her everything, including the fact that she's not actually killing people. Knowing that she can trust her and desperately wanting Nehemia to believe her about everything, she even takes her down into Elena's tomb. While she's looking at the constellations carved on the floor, she sees the Terrasin stag, which remember is like the Lord of the North that she sees every once in a while, that big white deer. His stars point to a face carved into the wall. You can only see it if you're standing on the constellation, then all of a sudden it like appears. One of the eyes is hollow. She looks into it, but she can only see into another room through the wall. And Mort is completely not helpful and won't tell her anything about it. Because of all the word marks in the tomb, Nehemia finally agrees to help teach her that language so that she can start to understand it a little bit more. Nehemia doesn't believe that the eye in the wall or uh, Selena's eye of Elena necklace are the ones referenced in that only with the eye can one see rightly riddle. She isn't even sure that that man that Selena killed is smart enough to be connected to any of it. We get a Kale point of view. We're having another ball to honor Holland, that annoying little brother that Dorian has. Kale also hates him 
and he says he dreads him coming of age and being old enough to rule one day. Dorian is dancing with all the court women, looking like he's having a truly terrible time. Selena is supposed to be guarding out near the balcony, and Kale looks over and she's gone. He goes outside and finds her dancing alone, because remember she loves a party. He can tell that she's kind of sad about Dorian and the fact that they've been watching him dance with all these women, but also she's just kind of sad that she can't dance herself. So he asks her, she's like, what? And he's holding out his hand and he goes, what didn't you understand? Oh my God. Sometimes he's got some real charm and this is one of those moments I normally don't like him. I don't like what he says. I don't like how he flirts, but this moment, what did you not understand? Oh my God. To her surprise, she gets a little smitten too. And she's like, yeah, okay. And she takes his hand and they start dancing. He's really good. And she is like swooning over it. They're just dancing in the back garden and she's losing her mind. Mid dance, she's like, we'll never be a normal boy and girl, will we? And he says, no. She gets so comfortable and happy with him that as she's looking up into his eyes and dancing with him, she says for the first time in more years than she can count, she feels like she's home. How did we get here? What on earth? <laughs> Dorian point of view, my sweet, sweet boy. He catches them dancing in the garden. Nehemia comes over and tells him not to make trouble for Selena and Kale. He says that he already decided to let her go and she's like, good, that's what you should have done the whole time. She says that the two of them being royals will always be set apart and they're always gonna have responsibilities and burdens that people like Selena and Kale will never understand. Then she tells him that Roland has been coming to her privately and threatening her and saying that if she doesn't get her father in line, things are gonna get worse for her people. Dorian is pissed. He's like, he's got no right to be talking to you like that. You're the damn princess. But also he can't stand up to his dad about it because his dad's scary. She reminds him about his love for Selena and all the things he would do for her. And she's like, all the other enslaved people of your empire deserve the same amount of love and respect, bro. She tells him that he has power in him more than he realizes. And then she traces a symbol on his chest all the court ladies are like, oh my God, what's going on? She touched the prince. Nehemia leans in and whispers, it sleeps in here. And when the time comes and it awakens, don't be afraid. When it is time, I will help you. I'm sorry, what? He is absolutely shook watching her walk away from him. And he says that something ancient inside of his chest opens its eye. What does that mean, Dorian? What does that mean? So the next day, Dorian finds out about the number of people that are being sent to that Calicullo labor camp. He's absolutely disgusted. Roland now has a ring that matches the rings that the king and Duke Parrington wear. So he's been initiated into the bestie circle. They're planning and holding this meeting to expand the camps to hold even more people and Dorian loses it. He gets in trouble with the king for speaking out of turn and Roland pips up and is like, no, but I actually um, agree. I think that this is a good idea. I think this is what we should do. Dorian keeps arguing with him and the king is like, I will kick you out if you don't shut up, you freaking idiot boy. And Dorian's like, okay, cool, whatever. And he just leaves. He goes running into the stone parts of the castle and hides. So he's like going down and down all the flights of stairs, trying to find a, a secluded, like quiet spot for him to let out his anger. And then when he finds it, he punches the wall. The stone cracks under his fist and then the window explodes. He's horrified and he's standing there going, why isn't my hand broken? And also why is there a ring, a perfect circle around where I was hiding on the floor and none of the debris touched me? He realizes, oh my God, somehow, some way I just use magic. That's not supposed to be possible. And he's so terrified and sad that he throws up. <laughs> Selena is starting to swoon over Kale a little bit. They keep hanging out at night. They're getting closer. She says that if they had more men like him, maybe they could rebuild the old courts and have the world that Nehemia says it used to be. Selena goes back to her rooms after visiting with Kale and finds Dorian waiting in the hall. She can tell something's horribly wrong with him, but he won't tell her anything except he was hoping to find Nehemia. It's cold in the hallway. Selena's like, what is going on? Is there a draft? What's happening? As he goes to leave, brushing past her, she sees something in his eyes. She describes it as a glimmer of color and power that still haunts the edges of her nightmares. I'm sorry, what? My boy has magic. I love Dorian. Also, I realized, Iggy, there's a big 
spoiler for the entire series at the very end you you probably should disappear for like the last second because I don't think you want to know that secret. Kale gets pulled into a secret meeting with the king. He wants him to have Nehemia watched. Her influence is starting to be felt in the castle walls and also people have been making threats on her life, but he doesn't want Kale to tell Nehemia or anyone else, meaning Selena. Kale agrees because at this point he still feels like his highest level of duty is to the king and to Dorian and it's not going to affect Selena because he's going to keep Nehemia safe so it's not going to matter. Dorian throws himself into training. Remember he's really good with a sword. He's trying to feel better, trying to get some of this excess energy out. Roland comes to him and apologizes for his behavior at that meeting where he went against Dorian and stood up with the king. He says he only agreed with the king because Duke Parrington asked him to. He's trying to be smart politically to gain more power. Dorian doesn't want to trust him, but Roland says, no, once I realized how much it meant to you, I called off the vote. Still kind of conflicted, Dorian walks away from him, kind of planning to think about it and come back to that because he's just a little too stressed right now to figure out if Roland's telling the truth or not. He ends up at the carnival that his mother has called to the castle grounds for Holland. It's like a belated Yule Miss present. And he runs into Kale and Selena also exploring the garden. It's still very tense. And now it's even more awkward between the three of them. They run into a woman called Baba Yellowlegs. She's one of the Iron Teeth witches. Remember, they have retractable iron nails and iron teeth. She asks Selena if she wants her fortune read. And Selena gets so scared of her that Kale has to like take her away. She calls after them, hide from fate all you like, but it will soon find you. We cut to Selena's point of view. She really was very scared of Baba Yellowlegs because remember she met Hansel and Hansel told her all those horror stories about how the Iron Teeth witches eat children. The boys wander over to the stables and Dorian gives Kale an Asterian stallion. Remember those fey horses that Selena and Hansel stole over in the desert? It's one of those. Kale is like, whoa, dude, I can't accept this. And Dorian's like, I don't know if you know this, bro, but I'm the prince, so you will offend me if you don't take it. It's Kale's birthday, by the way, his birthday's coming up. So Dorian wants to know what Kale's doing for it, and Selena gets all snippy and she's like, we already have plans. I have something planned for him. You can't have him that day. Dorian's obviously really hurt by this because once upon a time, the three of them were friends and they did a lot of stuff together. Selena can tell that she's hurting him, but she ultimately believes that she's doing the right thing and pushing him away. She's not, and it's stupid. But whatever, Selena goes back down into the tomb, even though she told Nehemia that she would not. Mort assures her that the necklace that she wears is the real deal and it's actually magic. So she puts it on the little hollow eye in the wall, but nothing happens, it doesn't work. She's annoyed that Mort isn't helping her more and he reminds her that if she would just ask him the correct questions, he would tell her the truth. <music> Selena has a dream that night of standing on a cliff facing a white stag on the other side of a ravine. She can't cross to him, so he turns away and walks away from her. She wakes up and says that she always has this same dream on this same night every year. And then she quietly leaves the castle alone and like runs out into the night. Kale's really confused about why Selena doesn't come to him for their morning run. He goes looking for her at her rooms, but instead finds Nehemia there having breakfast alone. She explains that she's pretty sure Selena left town for the day and she's gonna stay as far away from Rifthold as she can. Kale's like, why would she need to do that? And Nehemia is like, oh, because it's the 10th anniversary of her parents' deaths. Kale's horrified to realize that that means that Selena was only eight years old when they died. And remember, it was horrible. She crawled into bed with them thinking the bed was wet because the windows were open and it was raining and then woke up in the morning to figure out that they'd been stabbed to death and it was blood. She was laying in their blood all night. Nehemia admits that Selena didn't tell her that that's the day it was. She just has a feeling and sometimes you just know things without being told. So she's clearly keeping some secrets from Kale too. When she finally goes home, she finds Kale sitting in her room waiting for her. She doesn't want to speak to him, so she just quietly gets ready for bed and he's sort of standing there like, oh God, should I not have come? It was stupid of me to come. I should not have come. I should leave. But he brought her chocolate cake because she loves chocolate cake. And he says when she comes out from getting ready for bed that he thought maybe she would just like some company. He gives her a hug 
and she slowly returns it. Then the hug gets a little steamy, kind of all of a sudden, it's, it just happens. She looks up at him and says that she can't tell if the fact that she wants to hug him is something she should be ashamed about or if she should just be thankful that everything that's happened to her led him to her and now they're together. He's so startled that he pulls away from her and then she sits down and starts eating her chocolate cake and he's just like, I'm just gonna stay anyway because I'm her friend. But so they don't do anything, but the hug gets weird. Dorian goes through the family records trying to find traces of magic in his bloodline. He tells us a little bit more about the war and how his father had dozens thousands of magic wielders killed. He tells us about King Brannon's line, which is the Galanthiniuses. They were stupidly powerful and held like amazing magics that were not seen in the other families. Despite all that power in the bloodline, Terrison never raised a war against anybody. They had like a relatively small kingdom compared to everybody else, but they stayed to their borders and never tried to expand, which is what he wishes his dad had done in Adderlon. Remember the heir, Aelin, that Archer says people think is alive and Selena is like, no, absolutely not, she's dead. Her whole family died. Dorian also knows that she's dead and he's like, I wonder what would have happened if she'd stayed alive. Would we be friends? Would we be allies? Would she have been my wife? He even remembers meeting her once a long time ago when they were kids before his father killed her entire family. The clock chimes and he realizes that he needs to quickly go see Kale before Selena takes him out for his birthday dinner. He gets swept up in the emotions of losing Selena again and accidentally makes books fly off the shelves. He's really, really scared about this whole maybe having magic inside him thing. He feels like there's nobody he can trust because it's illegal and he's afraid if he tells anybody they'll have him killed. But maybe the witch at the carnival could give him some answers about why it's happening. So Selena is taking Kale out for his birthday. She's pretending she's not nervous, but she's so nervous. They go to an apothecary and then they go up onto the roof. She planned for them to have a special dinner in the glass greenhouse. She decorated it to look like the Fay Woman's garden from that song that they both loved and he knows immediately what it is and he's like, this is the coolest thing ever. He tells her that no one's ever done anything like this for him. They have a wonderful dinner, okay? Things are going really well. They're standing together, looking out at the city, looking at the stars. And she tells him that she hasn't been killing anybody and she just spills all the secrets. But instead of being happy, he's terrified and he's like, are you insane? The king will kill you in a heartbeat for lying to him. He also points out that he's the freaking captain of the guard. So the king is so spiteful and awful, he'll probably make Kale do the punishing. She tells him that she just doesn't want to see innocent people hurt because the king is ultimately the real enemy. And one day she's planning on running. He does a little 180 and is like, okay, well then I'm coming with you. She starts to cry and tells him that he reminds her of the way the world is supposed to be. And he kisses her. So they hook up, they go home and hook up. It's a pretty big deal, but I will say that this one at least is not the whole like, she's pure virginity, blah. like it's not that kind of thing. It's just like a realistic, first time, it's special, he's a good guy, it's that kind of moment. She says she feels at home with him and he's everything she's been waiting for. The next morning they wake up in bed together, he's still there, he's cuddling her, it's really sweet. He admits the king might fire him for being with her, but he doesn't care. They agree to keep it a secret, but not because they're like ashamed of each other, they just don't want each other to get hurt. And they both admit that they've liked each other for a very long time. They don't wanna tell Dorian either which is dumb. They act like if they tell him, he'll be hurt. But if you don't tell him and he figures it out, he's gonna be twice as hurt. You guys are stupid and you're all supposed to be adults. Dorian, meanwhile, is going to see Baba Yellowlegs. She tells him she's the last born witch of the witch kingdoms, which makes her over 500 years old. The witches are bred with either Fae or Vogue. They can't remember which one. Reminder, the Vogue or the evil Fae, which is what the Dark Lord used when he was fighting the Fae. We're gonna get more info on it. You're, you're getting pieces for now. She tells him that magic is in fact gone. Nobody in the empire has it, even though maybe on other continents they do. She tells him that if someone had magic, they should look deeper into why magic vanished in the first place to see if there's some reason why they could be the exception to the rule. When he leaves her, he runs into Roland and he lies about why he was seeing Baba Yellow Legs. Roland like believes him, but Dorian is left feeling like maybe Roland was spying on him. Selena goes out tracking again, and for some reason, all the men on the list from Archer 
are leaving the city. Turns out Archer couldn't live with the guilt, so he warned them himself, and now they're all running. She's pissed, and she's like, if you don't get me more information by tomorrow, I will kill you myself and just go ahead and give your head to the king. We get a Kale point of view. He is just as happy as Selena is. He is loving being with her. He's also getting a little sloppy at work and starting to like let his mind wander to her and stuff like that. So he's not as like on his shit as he usually is. They're also getting real reckless for people that wanna keep things a secret, okay? They're hooking up in broom closets. They need to get it together. Nehemia and Selena have some time bonding over the fact that they're doing it in broom closets. Nehemia is scandalized, but also it's like delicious gossip. She's very happy for Selena. Hard mood shift though, because Nehemia has been told that she needs to talk to the rebels and get them to stand down. She feels torn between trying to keep up her work in Rifthold and then going home to her family because her parents are overwhelmed and her brothers are all too young to rule. So she's kind of just stuck in charge. She wants Selena to promise her to free Elway and help her get her people to fight back. But Selena doesn't wanna be part of anything that could get them killed for hurting the king. Nehemia is like, when is it going to be enough? When are you going to fight back? What exactly is it gonna take for you to stand up and be brave? Selena's like, I'm only one person. And Nehemia's like, yes, but you're chosen by the queen. You're God's blessed. You are the one that's gonna help us. Nehemia tells us and Selena that the king is clearly up to some dark shit. We find out about the Farian Gap, which is like over in some of the desert mountains. People are disappearing. And those people that get close enough and come back, they say they hear wings. She says that Terrison never should have fallen and Selena needs to wake up because there's more going on and they need her help. Selena refuses to listen and just tells her to stop. And Nehemia is like, oh, okay, so you're a coward. Selena rounds on her and is like, when your people are lying dead around you, don't come crying to me. And they leave the fight like that, y'all. We get a small point of view scene between the queen and the princess. The queen says, one of them has to break. Only then can it begin. The princess says, I know, but the prince isn't ready. It has to be her. The princess starts to cry and says, for all our sakes, I hope you're right. Oh, I hate it. Kale is out with a hunting party having a terrible time because he doesn't like the other men in the court and he doesn't like listening to them gossip. The king comes over and tells him that he seems distracted and Kale is struck by how big and powerful the king feels. He just has like a lot of presence. He tells Kale that he's going to have Nehemia questioned in his council room the next night and Kale shouldn't tell anyone. Dorian wanders over and Kale lies about the meeting for Nehemia and Dorian points out that they haven't been seeing each other recently. Kale tries to lie his way out of it and Dorian's just like, Kale, treat her well and freaking rides off on his horse. Y'all had to know he would find out he's the damn prince. You really thought you were gonna keep that a secret? You're hooking up in broom closets and you didn't think he was gonna know? When Kale gets back to the castle, he still doesn't tell Selena about the meeting for Nehemia to be questioned, even though it's hurting him to lie. He's worried that the king is testing him to see whose side he's really on and he is still picking the empire. He's also starting to imagine marrying Selena. That thought distracts him so badly that he gets kidnapped. Is this man a himbo? Huh? Yeah. Okay. He's so dumb. <laughs> All right. He's the Steve Harrington of this universe. So Selena wakes up in bed alone. She gets a list of names from Archer delivered to her. So she goes out in the city to look at those new people. She comes back home after a day of work and Kale still hasn't come to visit her. The Sam PTSD sets in and she's like, oh, I will not be doing this again, absolutely not. So she goes running down to his rooms and finds a note for her from his kidnappers telling her to come after him alone or they'll kill him. She is livid and she drops into her like killing calm headspace and goes prowling into the city to kill all of them. Kale is chained up and he's been banged up a little bit, but ultimately he's fine. He figures out that the kidnappers are planning on Selena coming to get him. And he threatens that if they hurt her, he will rip them apart with his bare hands. He's really gone through some changes <laughs> in the last hundred so pages. The kidnappers clearly think that Selena is just like one girl and she's not gonna be that difficult for them to handle. And Kayla's like, oh, you are in for a world of hurt, you freaking idiots. Selena gets to the warehouse 
and she has dropped so far into herself that she is just like glazed and confused, ready to wreak absolute havoc. I don't know what these people were thinking because her PTSD with what happened to Sam has got her just like on another level ready to just like decimate anyone and everyone that looks at her. Kale sees her coming and is like, oh, it's about to be bad. She drops into the room and just starts butchering the people. They come after her in like a group of men, like just surround her and attack. And she just cuts them down like stalks of wheat. The guard that's been bullying Kale has been waiting for her and he looks excited as she gets closer and closer to him. But then another guard runs out and starts begging her to stop. He says that they don't need more enemies and there are worse things out there to face. Selena looks at him dead in the eyes and goes, no there aren't because I'm here now. We go back into Selena's point of view. She's got absolutely no intention of letting any of them talk and explain their side of the story. She just wants Kale back. She fights the guard with the two swords and she's beating him, but then Archer comes in and he puts himself in between her and the rest of the men, meaning that he's part of this group and he betrayed her and had Kale kidnapped. They unchain Kale and he wanders over to Selena. He's hurt, but like I said, he's fine. Archer tells us, that he's been working with Nehemia this whole time. It's been about six months since she came to the city and they've been trying to work with the rebels to go behind the king's back and undermine him. Nehemia has been taking all the information that Selena tells her and bringing it to Archer so that he can tell the rebels. Archer then reveals that Kale was ordered to question Nehemia that night and that's why they kidnapped him. Selena starts to get really scared and Archer is like, oh yeah, you should be worried. I sent men to the castle to try to help her, but I'm afraid that by the time they get there, it'll be too late. So Selena freaks out and goes sprinting like full tilt back to the castle, leaving Kale behind. She's even more upset that Kale lied to her and knew about what was going on so she's just like horrified, still in her killing calm headspace, running back to the castle. She gets to Nehemia's rooms and finds the princess dead in her bed. There is, oh, <laughs> it's not funny, but Eggie's face. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's so bad. What a conversation with the queen. With the queen, the queen and the princess, you know what I you have to do, it, don't you? I thought it was about kidnapping kill. Mm -mm. No. Yeah. She sacrificed herself. She sacrificed herself. Selena is absolutely torn apart about losing Nehemia. She's just standing in front of the bed, absolutely frozen, lost in her grief. She's also so mad at herself for not having been in the castle to protect her. Dorian comes into the room and stands next to her trying to get her to leave. He's crying. She turns to him and can kind of like see him through her days. And she reaches out and touches his face. And he's sort of just like, Selena, what are you doing? And then she touches his throat. She's thinking about the fact that he's the king's son. And this is kind of his family's fault. And it's all led back to him. And she's got her hands like on his throat, like caressing his jugular. And Dorian's just standing there like, oh my God, it's gonna be fine. I trust her. And Kale has his hand on his sword. Also, Kale got to the castle, okay? He's back too. So he's in the room and he's sort of just like, Selena, get your hand off Dorian's throat. Oh my God, I don't wanna have to cut off your hand. It's getting bad all around. She rounds on Kale and internally is like, he knew, he knew about this all along. And she freaking launches herself at him and just starts attacking. He lets it happen. He doesn't draw his sword or anything. He just tries to like keep her back as best as he can. But she's like a wild animal clawing at him. And she gets him across the face and gets like four claw marks down the whole side of his face. The guards try to intervene and Kale has to be like, no, nobody do anything. Put your weapons down because he doesn't want to hurt her. He's trying to get her to calm down. He's begging for her to stop, but she's refusing and just going for kill shots again and again and again. And he's starting to get tired holding her back. She gets him pinned and holds her dagger above his heart. He's holding her wrist and saying, I'm your friend, please. I'm your friend. Don't do this. She screams, you will never be my friend. You will always be my enemy. And then goes to lower the knife 
and then a phantom hand grips her and stops it from happening so she doesn't kill Kale. Kale says the room goes cold around them and he hears Selena yelling but he doesn't know who she's yelling at and then it just goes dark. So Kale has to take Selena down to the dungeons because she attacked the captain of the guard and she's in trouble. Dorian wants to give her his cloak and Kale's like, you can't be doing that, you're the prince. And also I don't trust her down here with anything but the clothes that she's wearing because she had all these weapons and he had to take those already. But now he's like, she's way too smart and we should just leave her down here completely alone. Dorian knows that Selena is the only one that knows he used magic to stop her from killing Kale. He doesn't even know how he did it. He just saw it happening and was like, that can't unfold. I refuse. And so he stopped her somehow. That's why she was yelling at him. But Kale hasn't put that together because he's an idiot. Dorian orders Kale to tell him everything that's happened with Nehemia and the kidnapping and Archer, all of that. He's leaving stuff out and Dorian can tell, but he gets most of the story. After everything they've been through, the thing that Kale can't get over is that Selena somehow made it back to the castle on foot quicker than he did on a horse. The boys also recognize that whoever killed Nehemia was selected by somebody to do it because how did they get into the castle? How did they know where to go? It just all feels too like artful and prepared to not have been a hit on the princess. Selena wakes up in the cell next to Caltaine. Caltaine is like, did you kill anybody deserving? And Selena thinks about Kale and is like, almost. At this point, she's done a 180 on him and she hopes to never ever see him again. Caltaine tells her that Duke Parrington is going out to Marath, which is near uh, the Farian Gap that we were talking about earlier. It's like the desert mountain area. He's taking her with him, so she's leaving the dungeons. She once again says that her headaches are even worse and she's still hearing wings. This time Selena is like, oh, interesting. Nehemia mentioned hearing about wings over in the Therian Gap. And Nehemia was having dreams that she said were filled with wings and shadows. Caltaine whispers to her that if they ever let Selena out, she needs to make sure they're all punished one day. And Selena vows to do it. They leave her in the dungeons for three days and keep giving her drugged water. And she keeps drinking it, even though she knows it's drugged because she just wants to sleep and be in oblivion. Ress, the sweet guard that likes her so much, that's like basically Kale's like second in command. He's keeping tabs on her himself and then reporting everything back to Kale. On the fourth day, Kale breaks down and is like, I can't do this anymore. And so he goes and gets Selena and carries her back up to her rooms. Apparently the king isn't angry. He just seems really smug about everything that happened. And all he told Kale was to get her into line. Kale also tells us that he knew the second that Selena turned away from the bed and looked at him in Nehemia's room that he'd lost her forever and she would never let him in again. Selena wakes up in her bed, back up in her room, and she realizes that the king's not gonna kill her, or he would have done it already, but also she's never gonna see Nehemia again. She spends several days in bed grieving, not talking to anybody, hardly eating, just like dealing with her pain. We get a point of view chapter from a young girl in the Calicula mine, which is the one that Nehemia was trying to get disbanded. It's the one full of all the Elway people. She has been keeping herself alive and getting through the day with the knowledge that Nehemia is over in Rifthold fighting for their freedom. And then they find out that Nehemia is dead. So the girl turns to the overseer closest to her, starts reciting her list of the dead, adds her own name to it, and then freaking stabs him with her pickaxe. Chaos in the mines. Dorian is now being followed through the castle with extra guards because of Nehemia's death, which is not good because he's trying to hide the fact that he's a magic wielder. The king wanted to take absolutely no responsibility for what happened to Nehemia, even though she was killed in their castle. Dorian was like, no, we're not doing that. So he sent a personal letter to her parents apologizing and telling them he was so sorry. He explains to us that the night that he stopped Selena from killing Kale, it felt like he was using like an extra third hand to stop the dagger, but he has no idea how he did it. And he's running off of like instinct with the magic. And he's really, really afraid that if he can't keep his emotions under control, he's just gonna 
slip up and people are gonna find out and he's gonna get killed or something worse. It's something worse. Selena has been getting out of bed and sitting by the fire and she's slowly, as the days go by, starting to like wake up and formulate a plan. She knows that everybody's really worried about her, like Ress and Philippa, they keep checking on her but she's not really giving them anything. But she tells us that she has no intention of ending her own life before she gets done what she needs to do. She knows that Grave, that horrible, creepy assassin from the last book, is the one that killed Nehemia. So she goes down into the tomb, and Mort is like, I'm so sorry about your friend. She ignores him. Then she uses the secret river passage to get away from the castle without anybody knowing. Remember the vaults where Sam was fighting for money? She goes there. The people recognize her and they're like, you got out of the mines because she's been kind of avoiding those old acquaintances, but she's back now and she's calling in her debts and she's like, I need to find Grave. Somebody tell me where he is. We get a Grave point of view of him running through the city trying to hide from Selena. He was pretty sure that he'd gotten away with Nehemia's death, so he's been bragging about it and telling everybody that he did it, which is how she found him. He's so arrogant and stupid that he thinks he can take her easily. And then she cuts his shins and like severs things so that he can't run. And he's just like crawling on the cobblestones trying to get away from her. She wants to know who hired him. And he's like, girl, I don't know what you're talking about. Don't hurt me. So she puts daggers in his thighs to keep him in place on the ground, then takes his hand and tells him to pick a finger. That finally gets him to break and he's like, I'll tell you everything. I'll tell you everything if you just let me go. We go to Dorian, who's in a council meeting with his dad and the other lords. When Selena comes in, carrying Graves' head, she gives it to the minister that had been uh, the one sponsoring Grave. So Grave was his champion. She puts it on his plate and she's like, there you go, minister. I believe this belongs to you. The king is like, girly pop, explain yourself. What's going on? That minister had already publicly argued with Nehemia about the mines. And so Selena is like, uh, do you remember that fight? Yeah, he hired Grave and he brought Grave into the castle and he had him kill Nehemia. It's all this dude's fault. Kale is clearly horrified by how Selena is acting and also like deeply annoyed with her. And she's just ignoring him and not looking at him while he tries to get her to stop talking. Cause she's sitting in a chair with her feet propped up on the table right now, just like nonchalant being ridiculous. Dorian is standing there like, oh my God, if they start fighting each other, my magic is absolutely gonna come out and I'm gonna get in so much trouble. So he's like doing deep breathing exercises in the corner. Then she gives the king a list of names names that she says were people she was looking into before Nehemia. She already killed them, that list that Archer had given her. She went and killed those people and she gives it to the king and she's like, they're all dead. There you go. The king and Selena smile at each other and Dorian says it's the most terrifying thing he's ever seen. The king is like, well done, champion. And then he has that minister, the one sitting in front of Graves' head, carried off to the dungeons. Selena leaves the castle again and goes to see Archer. He tells her he's sorry. And she's like, you're sorry, Kale's sorry, the whole damn world is sorry. He says that even though Nehemia promised that Selena could be trusted, he needed to see for himself and make sure. And so that's why they kidnapped Kale and everything. And clearly they went about it the wrong way, but he promises that they weren't trying to hurt her or Kale. Turns out the list of names that she gave the king is the men she killed when she dropped into the room and was trying to save Kale. So before they could stop her, she did kill people. She apologizes to Archer because obviously she wasn't intentionally trying to kill rebels. She didn't know that's what they were. Archer is devastated about the loss of Nehemia because he says that she was a friend and an ally and they desperately need her to win. He wants Selena to replace Nehemia, but she refuses. And she's like, you've got five days to get out or I'm killing you and giving your head to the king. Kale's dad is visiting. They're having this awful father-son breakfast meeting. He's the worst dude. You thought the king was annoying? This guy sucks. His dad still has all these expectations for him, even though Kale abdicated the, the lordship position. So it should all be his brother's problem and not his. The dad is like, yeah, no, you're a disgrace to the family. 
but you're a better option for air than your brother because at least you're a warrior. Your brother's just an idiot scholar who wants to read all day. So he wants him to return home because he says the family needs him. His dad also knows about his relationship with Selena and clearly like wants to use that to their advantage. And Kale gets so riled up that he just like storms out of the room, which he knows is what his dad wanted all along. So then he's even more annoyed with himself, but he can't help it because he's like very angry right now. Selena goes through her closet and burns everything that reminds her of spending time with Nehemia, like all her pretty dresses, she just burns them. Then she tells Philippa to get her an entirely new wardrobe. Then she goes to Nehemia's room and carefully boxes up all of her things. She finds all of her notes and scribblings about the word marks and like Nehemia's research regarding the rebels. So she's putting all of that away. And she sees a note that says, do not trust. And then there's like a wyvern like scribble symbol, which is the king's royal seal. And and Selena's like, oh yeah, no shit. I know I can't trust him. She also sees that Nehemia was researching that riddle, the one that's like, it is only with the eye that one can see rightly. Even though Nehemia told her that it wasn't a big deal and it probably meant nothing, she's been researching it the whole time. All of a sudden, Selena's like, oh my God, I know what it means. And she goes running off to the tomb. Remember how Damaris is the sword of truth? Mm-hmm. Damaris has an eye-shaped pommel carved on it and it perfectly matches that weird little eye cut out in the wall. She holds it up to it and looks through and sees a poem. It reads, By the Vogue three were made of the gate stone of the word. Obsidian the gods forbade and stone they greatly feared. In grief he hid one in the crown of her he loved so well to keep with her where she lay down inside the starry cell. The second one was hidden in a mountain made of fire, where all men were forbidden despite their great desires. Where the third lies will never be told by voice or tongue or sum of gold. So now she's even more confused. While she's freaking out in the hallway with Mort trying to get answers to the riddle, Elena shows up. They talk and Elena tells her that her own death was painless and easy and she was an old woman in her bed surrounded by her children and her children's children. Selena is like, yeah, well, Nehemia wasn't old, okay? She didn't deserve this. Elena agrees, but she does say that once her soul left her body, she was no longer uh, in any pain and she was at peace, but she won't tell them where they are. Selena so then dresses in all black and goes outside to Nehemia's grave and sings to her. Kale secretly followed her outside and he catches her singing. He says that the language she's using is ancient and powerful and he does not recognize the words. He tries to talk to her, but she won't even look at him. So he just gives up and goes back inside. Dorian is now in the library looking for secret books on magic when Selena catches him. It's weird and a little tense. She apologizes for her recent behavior. He tells her that he understands and that was apparently all she needed to hear because she just like completely softens and they have a nice moment. Kale is hiding from his dad in the library and he catches this happening and he's like, well, damn, at least she's talking to somebody. He came to the library to figure out what song Selena was singing because he's slowly starting to realize that she is hiding a big, bad, terrible secret. The librarian says that all the funeral songs from Terrison are in the common tongue, but they have heard a rumor about how in the high court, they would sing special songs when the nobility died and those songs were in the language of the Fae. Only people of noble blood would know those songs. So Kale is scared shitless because he's like, oh my God, she was a member of the court. Her family must be important. No wonder she hates the king so much. She's an actual threat to the empire. Dorian invited Selena up to have dinner with him. And even though she was a little nervous, she went. So she's in his tower for the first time. His rooms are covered in books. Our sweet boy loves to read so much. He was actually reading when she was coming up to see him. So he didn't even clear the table yet because he got distracted. He was too invested in the chapter he was on. We learned that he doesn't really let his servants come up and clean the room for him, which is why it's so messy because he knows where everything is and he doesn't want people touching his stuff. Also, he doesn't even have people dress him like she does because he likes to do things for himself. He asks what made her decide to join him. She says she had nowhere else to go. And he says, well, then you will always have a place here. Kill me, I can't do this. 
We get a small Dorian POV where he says that he can tell how hurt she is by everything and he's thankful that he can be there for her and also he kind of hates himself a little bit because there's this small part of him that's like, I'm glad she didn't get Kale to do this for her. I'm glad I'm the one doing it. He's still a boy. Don't forget that. Even though she's scared of her, Selena takes the secret poem to Baba Yellowlegs out in the carnival to try to get some answers. She ends up paying her to answer her own questions, but then also to keep quiet about whatever it is that Dorian talked to her about because Baba Yellowlegs doesn't tell her, but she hints that if Selena and the prince aren't careful, she's going to sell his secrets to the highest bidder. Inside the caravan, Every available surface is just covered with mirrors and it makes Selena really uncomfortable. There's like a fireplace burning and the smoke smells really bad and there's piles of bones on the floor. So Selena's very uncomfortable. Baba Yellowlegs says that the poem describes the three word keys that open the word gate. Selena tells her to name her price for more information and Baba Yellowlegs is like, nameless is my price, but gold will do for now. That is so important, do not forget it. She confirms that the word governs all life and that there are multiple worlds existing at once. And if you have the word gate open, you can travel between them. So long ago, three demons slipped through and these were the Vogue Kings. They destroyed part of the gate to make these three keys and it meant that they could control the power and it was like really dark and evil and twisted. So the Fae found out and fought back by hiding the keys. According to Baba Yellowlegs, the king already has one of these keys, which makes sense because the magic and the weird power that he has feels really evil. And that's probably the only way he could have managed to destroy magic. Then Baba Yellowlegs ruins everything by trying to kill Selena, so Selena fights back and ends up killing her and then burning her body because she doesn't want anybody finding out that she did it. Kale went through the genealogy records, but there's no family listed with Selena's last name. He's not super surprised because he was pretty sure she was lying about that name anyway, but he doesn't know what to do to get more info. So there are six families from Terrison that have survivors that would be around Selena's age, but he can't figure out where she would be and what family she'd be from. Selena goes back down into the tomb and Mort can smell the fact that she killed a witch on her. Selena shows him these like new scars that she has. Baba Yellowlegs had like grabbed her by the throat. So she has these scars wringing her neck in like a necklace um, that are like from the iron nails. He tells her that they won't be a normal wound and they probably won't heal correctly. He also warns her about the Blackbeak and the Blue Blood clans, which allied with the Yellowlegs to defeat the Krokens when they were having the big witch war. Since Baba Yellowlegs was a clan leader, Leader, she will probably be hunted by the witches. Before she leaves the tomb, she takes Damaris and the Ancient Blades again, even though Mort is like, don't be doing that. You cannot take that blade. It's a noble blade. Uh, it was the king's blade. So he's like, don't use it for nefarious purposes. And she is absolutely about to use it for nefarious purposes. Kale goes into Selena's rooms while she's down in the tomb, even though he knows it's a bad idea. This man is such a Hufflepuff. He literally thinks to himself that if she attacked him, he would just let her kill him because it's what he deserves. He explores her desk because he's nosy and he finds the word mark scribblings, but he doesn't know what they mean. Then he finds her will dated two days before Nehemia's death. She left everything to him. The only thing she asked him to do was consider giving some of it to Philippa. She comes back into the room and catches him and is like, I'm not gonna change it. She says that at least now when the king fires him, he'll have something to fall back on. And he realizes it's about even more than that because she knew all about his shitty family. So what she was worried about was him having to go home. So she stopped that from happening. So now if the king fires him, he has his own life he can build and he won't have to go crawling back to his evil parents. He's speechless, but he also realizes in shock and horror that she never had any plans to betray him or the empire because if she went against the king, she would not get her inheritance. She would just be labeled a traitor and killed and Kale never would have gotten any of the money. She orders him out and he runs away and he doesn't even make it back to his rooms before he like ducks into a closet and starts crying. Hufflepuff, Hufflepuff behavior. 
Selena goes down into the secret tunnels under the library and uses a word mark to open the iron door. She finds fingernail marks, like four fingernail marks on the walls of the iron door. Just thinking about that hurts me. She also finds piles of cleaned bones. It turns out that the catacombs under the library lead to the obsidian clock tower. The second riddle, remember, said that the word gate was obsidian and that's the rings that the king and his evil little circle wear. She realizes, oh my God, I'm in deep danger. I'm in trouble. I need to go. She tries to run. And then she realizes she's not alone in the tunnels. Don't worry though. Turns out Dorian had a feeling and he felt that something was wrong and he went after her and followed her down into the tunnels. We get a point of view of the freaking monster creature that's watching Selena. So it thinks it has thoughts like a human. It got out because it learned how to make the word marks itself. So it just opens its own doors, goes and wreaks havoc in the castle, and then comes back and locks the doors behind it so nobody knows it escaped. It's looking at her and the eye of Elena necklace is like flashing like crazy, but it's not enough to stop the monster this time because there's no other light. It doesn't like light or fire and there's none of that going on. So it's able to keep attacking her. She starts running, it chases her, she sees Dorian on the stairs and she's like, go, get the hell out of here. So they start running together back up through all the doors. He helps her close the door closest to the entrance back into the library. But remember, iron and magic don't like each other. So he's like using all his weight and throwing all of his magic into the door to close it. And he's burning himself out on the door because it's also draining him and hurting him. So they use more of the word marks. Selena like cuts her arm and starts writing with her own blood to make like a binding spell. They open the door, the creature runs in, gets frozen in place and she kills it. They end up back in Dorian's room, bonding over whatever the frick just happened. Now they can share their secrets. So they both start telling each other everything. Obviously now she knows officially that he has magic. So she thanks him for having not let her kill Kale that one time. They agree to take it day by day together and help each other out as best they can. Selena realizes that both Lady Caltain and Roland were having headaches, which probably has something to do with the evil magic the king is using. From a book, she learns that Caltain's family line had magic once upon a time. Obviously we know that Dorian's line has magic, so that's why Roland's involved. And then it turns out Cain from the last book also had magic in his bloodline. So clearly the king is picking certain people and using them as evil little pawns. Remember Elena's tomb? has ah times rift written on it, she figures out that that's an anagram. It actually says, I am the first, meaning that that's where the first word key was put. Turns out the King of Adderlon already has it. So that's confirmation that that's what's wrong with him. That's why he's evil. He's using the freaky word magic and doing evil things with it. That's how he's been stifling magic. That's what's wrong with Dorian. It's all connected. She then decides, that she's too overwhelmed by all this knowledge she's figured out in like three pages that she's gonna make a portal and summon Nehemia from the other world so she can talk to her. Dorian has a dream where he sees Gavin and Gavin is like, my boy, if you don't go after your girl right now, you're gonna lose her forever. She is in grave danger. So he wakes up and goes frantically running after Selena to stop her. So Selena opens a portal down in the tunnels. Nehemia comes through and she's like, I didn't think you were this stupid. You cannot be doing this. Portals are dangerous. She tells her that Selena was a bright light and that she knew her fate and she ran to it unafraid. This is a very controversial plot point and I am not the one to talk about it. So I'm just gonna give you a brief rundown. Race in SJM is a very ridiculous controversial topic because sometimes like in this book, we're gonna meet a group of people that are very clearly supposed to be from India. The culture's like very similar, all of it's kind of referenced. It makes sense. Then sometimes she'll be like, they were really tan. They were so tan and they had dark hair and we're supposed to figure that out for ourselves. Are they white and they've been in the sun for a long time? Or are you talking about people that are brown? It's it's just ridiculous. She doesn't do a good job. The issue here is that Selena is white and Nehemia is a woman of color and her death spurs on the plot for Selena. And that's a trope that happens a lot that is pretty dangerous. My thing is with this story specifically, 
Selena never forgets about Nehemia, and it's not just Nehemia's death that kind of spurs this. Like Sam is also a plot point in this way. Wesley is another one. And then there are more people as the story goes on. So in this case, it's just a list of reasons and Nehemia is on it. However, it does suck that Nehemia gets taken out so soon because now all the key players are white. I will say though, again, for this story in particular, there are gonna be several people of color that become very important. We just haven't met any of them yet. They're coming in the next book. So I personally love that Selena never moves on from Nehemia and never forgets her. Like all the way into the last book, she's gonna be bringing her up and thinking about her and remembering her. Back in the tunnel room though, Nehemia disappears through the portal. And then, Archer shows up because Nehemia taught him about the passageways. So Archer tries to stop Selena from opening up the portal. And while they're scuffling together, she sees on the inside of his wrist, a tattoo. What's it a tattoo of? That weird little wyvern symbol that Nehemia had written, do not trust the weird little wyvern symbol. It's Archer. So she thought it was the king, but it, mm, it's him. Turns out, Archer wants to tell everybody about the word gate and the word keys so that they can take power from the king and give it to themselves. So she's panicking, but she slips into a lie and she tells him that she thinks he's right. And that's a great idea to make a new world for them. Clearly, Nehemia just didn't understand his vision. He's a dumb, dumb boy. So he believes her and just starts spilling all his secrets. He tells her that Nehemia left the rebel group because she was afraid of them gaining more power. And also, Archer is the one that sent Grave after Nehemia, which Selena really should have known because remember when Archer was like, I sent men to the castle to help her. Where were they? Because we never saw them. She tricks him into thinking that she wants to be with him romantically. Again, he's stupid, so he gets way too close and she stabs him. He saw it coming though, so he got out of the way and she only got him in the arm instead of in the heart like she was aiming for. And then a demon comes through the portal. Dorian, still half-dressed, because remember it's the middle of the night, goes and gets Kale, and then they go running to Selena's room together because they know she's in danger. They find the secret door in her room and it's open. Kale's like, you need to stay here. And Dorian's like, like, Frick, I'm gonna stay here, are you kidding me? So they go running down together. They find Selena unconscious and Archer holding the book that she was using to write the word marks, chanting something. And then the monster standing over the two of them. Dorian uses more of his magic. Turns out it's considered raw magic, so he can pretty much like do anything he wants with it. He can use any element or the shadow hand situation. Archer takes the book and runs away with it before anybody can stop him. That unfortunately means that they cannot close the portal. So Dorian gets Selena and they start running back upstairs to try to get other books that have the word marks written in them to figure out how to close it. Kale stays behind to buy them time, even though he knows he's absolutely gonna die. He cannot hold the demon back on his own. And then Fleetfoot, who followed Selena down earlier because she wanted to see Nehemia too, gets grabbed by the monster and dragged through the portal. So Kale jumps in after them. Selena is so scared that even though she's injured, remember she was unconscious like a second ago, she's like, absolutely not. And she goes sprinting through the portal too. She says she doesn't think twice as she jumps through and feels the magic on the other side before she unleashes the monster inside herself. It's getting intense, Eggie. <laughs> I'm so invested. <laughs> I'm so Kale watches her jump through. He's like protecting the dog. And he says the moment she comes through the portal, it's like a fog gets lifted from her features. She becomes longer and more graceful and her ears stretch into delicate points. Then she unleashes a stream of blue fire at the creature and roars like an animal. Kale says there's nothing human about the sounds coming out of her or the way she looks because she's not human anymore. She's Faye. 
It's a hard fight, but she manages to get them out and stops the creature. When they pull her back through the portal, she loses her magic and becomes a human again. So Dorian doesn't know what happened. He can just now see them together and he's like, why isn't Kale touching Selena? What the heck happened when they went through the portal? She can't close the gate because she says she used too much of her power, but then she turns to Dorian and she's like, you can do it though. He's not afraid of her, so he just cuts his arm and lets her use his blood. You need like magic in the blood, you know, I don't. it works if there's magic in your blood. She changes the word marks and then they're able to close the portal. Then Selena goes running after Archer because remember, he still has the book. She finds him and he begs her to let him go because he truly believes that he is just fighting for their freedom and trying to fix the empire. He just can't see that he has now also gone corrupt and that the power that the king is using is dangerous no matter who's using it. Like even if you're trying to use it for good, it's not gonna work that way. She tells him, okay, I'll let you go but only because Nehemia didn't want me to give in to the darkness growing inside of me. He goes, I knew you were a good woman. And then she stabs him in the heart and says, no, I'm not, but Nehemia was. I love her. Kale followed her like an idiot. I don't know what he expected to see, but her killing Archer without feeling and without remorse horrifies and disgusts him. Afterwards, the boys go with her to her rooms because obviously they need to talk about what happened. She tells Dorian to go and that she'll come talk to him next. And he's like, I see how it is, but he leaves and he doesn't argue. So she tells Kale first that her great grandmother was Faye. When magic disappeared, she lost the ability to shift, but that is like a typical Faye power. Normally, if you're Faye, you have like your fae form and then you can turn into an animal typically. For whatever reason, Selena has a fae form and she can turn into a human version of herself. So when she went through into the other realm, there was magic there and that's how she was able to use it. He knows and understands that she can't trust him anymore because he still works for the king. And even though he like knows all of that, he still almost tells her that he loves her, but she stops him before he can say it. When Kale leaves her rooms, he realizes that her being Fae and being in the glass castle with the king is like the most dangerous thing ever. And she will never be safe, especially now that they know the secret. So he goes to his dad and forms a plan to get her out of the castle. He's like, why don't we send her over to Windland and let her kill that royal family? And then it would leave them open for attack by us and that could be where we expand the empire next. His dad is like, that's a bloodthirsty, evil little plan. I love it. Obviously, Kale doesn't really want her to kill that guy, but he just wants her out of the castle so that she can be safe somewhere else. Also, Windlin is one of the countries where there are still fae and magic, so maybe she could go be safe with them over there. In return for his dad helping him get this plan to move through with the king, Kale agrees to go back to Aniel like he was supposed to, but he obviously never wanted to do it. Selena does go to Dorian after she finishes talking to Kale and she tells him everything too. She tells him about Mort down in the tomb and she's like, maybe he could help you. I know that you wanted information from Nehemia, but Mort knows a lot and I bet he could help you figure out some stuff about magic and at least like why it's happening to you now. She also acknowledges that Dorian, just like Kale, is the kind of man who could help build the country and the world that Nehemia wanted. So if they could just kill his dad, he'd be an amazing king. Speaking of the king, he's super excited and pleased about Kale's plan to send Selena away. He's also really excited to get Selena away from Dorian because remember, of course he knows about all their friendships and he didn't want her anywhere near his son. That same day, he brings Selena down into the council room so that they can tell her this plan. Instead of freaking out, she just smiles and says it would be an honor to go and serve the crown in this way. Remember in the last book when Selena won the championship and she had that weird mark on her forehead? The king remembers it too. And he says that even he doesn't know what it means. And it was some weird word mark that he'd never seen before. He says it either means nameless, unnamed, or anonymous. Even though she lied to the king and acted happy, Selena is livid 
that she's being shipped off somewhere else so soon. And she's mad that Kale decided all of this without even telling her. She goes down to the tomb and Elena is waiting there for her. Elena, instead of being sympathetic, is like, girl, I'm so sorry. You're gonna have to go on this journey and you're gonna have to stop running from your past. Good luck. Kale flat out lies to Dorian and says that he's sending Selena away because he thinks she's dangerous. So Dorian's pissed and he's like, listen, my guy, if anything happens to her, I will make you regret the day you were ever born. Kale has the absolute nerve to look at him and go, one of us has to start leading Dorian and then leave him alone in the hallway. The boys are fighting. Selena visits Nehemia's grave. She says that Nehemia was right. She is a coward, but she's done running and she is going to help free Elway. She goes so far as to invoke a blood oak, promising to destroy the king and fix the empire and save Elway and do all the things that Nehemia wanted from her. And blood oaths are like a big deal in these books. In the morning, Dorian goes to say goodbye to Selena. She was gonna sneak off without even saying goodbye to him, but he stopped her from doing that because he's smart. She hates goodbyes, that's why. It's not that she doesn't like him. He tells her that he will think of her every day that she's gone and be worried about her constantly. And also he'll look after Fleetfoot while she's away. He wants to hug her, but he's afraid that she won't like it and he doesn't want to upset her. So he respects her boundaries. She thanks him for all that he's done for her and for being her friend and for not being like the others. And then she says, I'll come back. I'll come back for you. And they part ways. All right, so I'm going to read you this next part and then I'm not going to let you hear the ending ending but I'm gonna leave you on this cliffhanger. <laughs> oh shit, okay. God damn it. And he's like, yeah, you're gonna read the books, bitch. So Kale then meets Selena on the docks while she's getting ready to leave. She tells him that she understands why he did what he did, but even though he was hoping to send her away forever, she's gonna have to come back to Rifthold one day. Then she very quickly tells him everything about the king and the word keys and the word gates and all the secrets that they uncovered. She gives him the Eye of Elena necklace and tells him to never take it off because it will protect him from harm. Then she whispers something into his ear. We don't know what she says, but internally she tells us that it will make him understand even if it will also make him hate her forever. When she pulls away, he's like, what does that mean? What are you talking about? And she's like, I need you to know that when you figure it out, it never mattered to me. None of it ever mattered. I would still pick you. He tells her that he loves her and she says that she's sorry. She gets on the boat. He stands at the edge of the dock. She watches him as they sail away. And then once she can't see him anymore, she keeps looking at him until finally, she turns her back on Adderlon and looks forward into the horizon and sails to Windland. I just kicked Eggie out because Eggie wants to read the books and what I'm about to tell you is the biggest spoiler in the entire series. Okay, are you prepared? You're not, let's do it. So Kale is super confused on what Selena told him. It was a month and a day and nothing else. He's figured out that it's the day her parents died. Back in her rooms, trying to figure out the answers, he sees the books that Dorian left because when Dorian came to say goodbye, he dropped off some books that he wanted to kind of keep hidden. And some of these books are the royal genealogies. He goes digging in the book and looks up the date and he reads, this morning, King Orlon Galathinius, his nephew and heir, Roe Galathinius, and Roe's wife, Evelyn, were found assassinated. Orlon was murdered in his bed at the royal palace in Orinth, and Roe and Evelyn were found dead in their beds at their country estate along the river Florin. There is no word yet about the fate of Roe and Evelyn's daughter, Aelin. He goes absolutely cold, numb, shock all over, thinking that Selena must be telling him that she knows the truth about Aelin and she knows where she is. So he keeps digging for more. He figures out that Evelyn's maiden name is Ash River and she has magic in her bloodline. So not the father, not Rose bloodline, but Evelyn's bloodline is where the magic is. There are three Fae sister queens, Maeve, Mab, and Mora. Mab is the youngest and the prettiest of all of them. She's the one that was turned into a goddess when she died, Deanna the goddess of the hunt. Remember when Selena got given that golden arrow at the Yule Ball? Turns out Mab 
is Aelin's great-grandmother. Remember when Selena said that her great-grandmother was Faye? He reads on and sees that it's believed that Aelin's body was thrown into the river. Remember when Selena said that Arabin found her half frozen on the riverbed? Lastly, he finds a scribble about the famed Ash River eyes. They're supposed to be brightest blue, ringed with gold. He realizes, oh my God, that's why Selena could never look the king in the eye. Selena isn't helping Aelin gain power. Selena is Aelin. She's the lost freaking queen of Terrison, and he just sent her sailing off to her mother's homeland to be surrounded by her strongest allies and friends. Believe it or not, this will not be the last time that Kale sends somebody in a ship somewhere he should not be sending people in a ship. How freaking sick and twisted is that? I love it. I went into the series, unfortunately, knowing this twist before I got to it, which I wish I wouldn't have, but I'm hoping my sister, who ran outside and hid, will not know until they get to this part in the book. And I just, I can't wait for that phone call because they're gonna be unhinged, screeching. I can just hear them now. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, leave a like, comment down below. Did y'all? see the reveal coming. I definitely like, I feel like the hints are there and they're really fun and they're like little breadcrumbs sprinkled throughout. I think it's silly and goofy that Kale didn't figure it out sooner. And also, Dorian babes, you met her. Remember when Selena was like, I've been here before. I was here in a carriage in fancy clothes that I didn't like. Yeah, that was when she came and she met Dorian, okay? So he remembers her too and he still doesn't put two and two together and realize that it's her. That's a little silly, goofy, and wild, but it's fine. If you guys are enjoying this series, don't be afraid to share it around. I know I've talked before about Carrie Can Read. She just did um, Frost and Starlight, so she has now almost done all of the Akatar books, and she's done Crescent City, and I'm tackling Throne of Glass specifically because she said she wouldn't be doing it, so I was like, I can do it, and it'll be so fun because I freaking love these books. As always, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you guys so, so soon. Have a good one. Bye. Mm -hmm.